Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland Devo 30. I am Pastor Ruben Solis. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. If you're in the neighborhood, come on by and join us at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. Before we get started, I just want to give a little invitation to you tomorrow from 11 to 1. We are having free spaghetti lunch with bread and salad and cake and all kinds of goodies and a clothes giveaway. There are a lot of new clothes, new shoes, and various other items. So if you're in need or know of someone in need, please let them know that they can come out tomorrow and pick and choose whatever it is that they have a need of. So uh, that's tomorrow, this coming Saturday. So today we will be in the book of Galatians, and we are in chapter 4. So if you want to grab your Bible, good morning, Diane. Grab your Bible, your highlighter, a cup of coffee, sit down, and let us, let us pray and get into the Word. Father, we just humbly come before you once again, Lord, just to simply read your Word, Lord, and allow the Spirit to expound upon the areas that you decide for us to share in the Lord and that you would minister to every one of us, Father, the things that we're going through, the things we're experiencing, Father, in our lives right now, the struggles, Father, the worries, or even the concerns, Lord. Father, we're just praying that, you, that Jesus, Lord, would just uh, fill in the gaps and help us, Lord, in those areas, Father. We truly do need him, Father. There are times where we're just helpless, Lord, without him. And so we just put our faith and our trust in him, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning again. Today we will be in the book of Galatians chapter 4 this Friday morning. So let's get right into it. As Paul continues, remember the book of Galatians is written to the, the Galateans who were dealing with the law of the Old Testament and the grace of God that Paul and Peter and those guys preached. But there was these religious leaders who came in and tried to stir things up. I think that that's, that is a warning sign, you know, a yellow flag, as you would uh, say for us. When someone comes in and stirs things up, I think we should, we should kind of take warning. Our antennas should, should all of a sudden stick up if someone comes into your church and all of a sudden they start, you know, complaining about something or trying to change something or saying something isn't right and it's wrong. And I think we, we, we should just all of a sudden go, whoa, whoa, something's not right here with this person. We need to be careful because those are the kind of people that divide the body of Christ. And we're not to divide it. We are to unite it. Amen. And if somebody has something that they need to, to share about the ministry, send them to the pastor. You know, just send them to the pastor. And usually that stops it because they're not going to go to the pastor. <laughs> they're, they're too fearful of that. Uh, so it just shows you that they're complainers. They just like to complain. So be careful. Be warned is these Judaizers went in there and they were causing some problems and even swayed Peter, right? Even swayed Peter and Paul had to rebuke him. So he says, now I say that the heir, that is the child of God, as long as he is a child, that is under age, does not differ from, at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardian and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Um, there were stewards that were hired in households at this time. And usually one of the duties that they had was to oversee the children's. Uh, they would teach them, train them. They were kind of like the uh, homeschooler administrator at that time. And so they were the ones that babysit. Uh, they were the nanny of the child and so forth. So as long as they were under age, they were under that steward there. And Paul is using that as an example here of the law. That as long as you're underage, uh, under the law, then you're under that stewardship, that grace of God. But under the guardians, as he said, and stewards until the appointed time by the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has set forth the Spirit 
of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. The only way that you can cry out, Abba, Father, is if you have the Spirit of God in you. That is the only way you can do that. I oftentimes will use, use this, this text here or another text in 1 John where he says, test the spirits. Uh, sometimes people will, will make a conclusion that somebody might be, might be demon-possessed or might not be a Christian. And so I'll use these texts and I'll start talking to that person. I'll say, you believe in Jesus Christ? And they'll say, yeah, but that's not enough because the devils believe and they fear and they tremble, Amen. right, James says. So uh, do you believe he's Lord? Do you believe he's Lord? Is he your Lord? And if they have a, tr a, a struggle saying that, you know, then you know that something's going on there. But if they simply say, no, Jesus is my Lord. I, I depend on him. He's my God. He's my Savior. Then chances are they're not demon-possessed because a de demon isn't going to admit that. He's, he's going to deny it or he's just not going to say it or he's going to kind of go around uh, circles of that, kind of around the bush and get to something else to divert you from that thing. So bringing them back as Jesus your Lord. Can you call him Lord? You know, that type of thing. Um, and usually they will... They will not say that if they're demon possessed. If they know the Lord, then they usually they'll say, "Yes, He's my Lord. He's my Savior, and I call Him Lord." So chances are that they're baby believers, you know, or maybe not mature believers, or coming to know Christ. So we can't make those judgment calls too quickly. So he says in verse six, "Because you are sons of God, uh, has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your heart, crying out, Abba, Father." And so we cry out, Abba, Father, because the Spirit's in our heart. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, uh, that is, to other gods in this world. That's what a slave is. We are slaves to Christ. The world is slaves to the gods of this world. But a son, <clears throat> and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. But then, indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. But now after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage? And he's talking about the law here. So before you became a Christian, you were in bondage to the law. You were in bondage to the culture gods. And all of us worship something before Christ. Whatever it was, some might worship alcohol, some might worship sexuality, some might worship, uh, you know, idols like rock stars or, you know, musicians of some sort or Hollywood. And I've seen people <clears throat> try to dress like the people they worship, right? <clears throat> and so yeah. forth. Maybe beauty. You worship beauty and so everything about you is beauty. You know, Facebook poses, Instagram shots and all that. You know, so you were worshiping something in this cultural world. When you come to Christ, then you begin to worship God and you let those things go and you begin to become a slave of God, a son of God, and no longer of this world. But there are some that go back to that. Could be because they never were saved or it could be that, like the parable, right, of the seed and the different soils, you know, it could be that the struggles of this world Amen. just pushes them away. You know, it could be that the enemy robs and steals them for whatever reason. So it's a good parable to read, by the way. Uh, it's good to read it every once in a while just to be reminded of how our hearts should be cultivated to the Lord. So he goes on, but now after you have known God, or rather is known by God. I love that part there, that you know God, but it's because he knows you, right? It's because he reached out to you. Uh, we're drawn to God or dragged to God. He comes and gets us. <laughs> And grabs us by the collar, you know, and says, come on, you're coming with me, kind of. And then he keeps you there. So, you observe days and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid uh, for you, at least I have labored for you in vain. It's a sad place when a, le a leader sees uh, someone all of a sudden turn away from the grace of God. Turn away from the teaching that they've taught. Um, throughout my ministry, and I'm sure it's the same for many pastors, when you have someone in the church that's been there for quite a long time and you've taught through the whole scriptures and you've taught on specific topics and situations and so you know that that the church has heard it one way or another and all of a sudden someone goes and does it exactly you know and you go were they not listening or did they not care you know or is it so consuming at that moment that they just throw it out the window 
you know, and you just go, well, what was I teaching for? You know, why was I saying those things in the first place if they're not going to listen? But that's not why I do it. I do it because I am commanded to do it by the Lord. But it's sad when, when all of a sudden uh, they turn away from, from those things and turn back into uh, the world. <clears throat> Verse, where were we at? Twelve. Twelve. Brethren, I urge you to become as I am, for I am as you are. You have not injured me at all. You know that because of physical infirmities, I preached the gospel to you at the first. And my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus what then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that, if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. So apparently Paul struggled with, with some trial or infirmity here, and some suggest because of the context here, he had eye problems. There are times when Paul says, I'm personally writing this letter with my own handwriting. It could be that he couldn't write too much because of his eye problems. And so he must have had eye problems in, in seeing people um, and paper. Who knows? As you get older, you, and I think it's still the same today, you're, 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 you're was it, um, the, the long, not the, peripheral, what do they call it now? Now I forget it. The what? Peripheral vision. Peripheral vision, but then there's the other one where your sight, whether it's long far, distance or sighted, short, far short, sighted, yeah. farsighted or nearsighted, right? If you're nearsighted, that means you can't see far. If you're farsighted, you can't see near. I remember when I turned 44, all of a sudden, I'm looking at my Bible and I'm going, man, it's blurry. What is going on here? So I went to the doctor saying, I can't see. And he says, how old are you? And I said, 44. That's about the age that your eyes start going. I'm like, <laughs> what? Called old age, you need bifocals. So I started wearing bifocals. And I got tired of losing my glasses everywhere, so I thought, I'm going to buy bifocals where I can see just with glass lens on the top and just wear glasses all the time. So that's what I do. The bottom is bifocals, the top is just glass so I can see. Um, that was devastating for me at that time. But that's probably what's happening to Paul. And then as you get older, you get cataracts, right? My mom just had... Uh, cataracts removed from her eyes and now she can see and what they do is they remove the the cataract and they put a lens in, in your eye and then sew it up and it becomes now your your lens to see things and not your cataract anymore so they have surgery for that so it could be that Paul's eyes were all cataract uh, completely and yet he was still received uh, as an apostle and he goes on and it says in verse 16 have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth uh, they zealously court you. Now listen to how he describes these, these Judaizers who come in. They jealously, zealously court you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you that you may be zealous for them. But it is good to be zealous in a good thing always, and not only when I am present with you. My little children for whom I labor in birth, Again, until Christ is formed in you, I would like to be present with you now and to charge, or to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. Now notice it in verse 17 where he says, they zealously court you. And there's a lot to say about courting, right? Because courting just doesn't mean they, they, they just come up and try to grab you. They actually court you. They do good things to you. Uh, we had a guy here. Uh, that was just charismatic in that, just could come up to you, talk to you, say all kinds of nice things about you. And the way that he would um, grab a hold of your your friendship and your heart was by comparing you to someone that was that you probably thought was better than you or that is better than you. And he would say things like, oh, you're much better than they are. You know, I've, heard, I've talked to them and they're nowhere where you're at, you know. And anytime they use flattery like that, you know something's going on. They're courting you to do something. And so this man uh, would do that with the church, create friends and court them and tell them all how good they are and how great they are and how God is using them. What a blessing they are to my family. What a blessing they are to, to me. And they were just constantly saying that. And, and eventually he was creating a mob you know, to divide the church, and that's what he did. He ended up dividing uh, the church here because they're flattery like that. That's how they work. Uh, I remember he came in and he started comparing me to Pancho Juarez. 
And he was, you know, comparing me and saying how Pancho really doesn't teach the word. I really enjoy your teaching. Your teaching is far much better, you know. And I'm just like, wow. So there's just no limit in courting, you know. Uh, and eventually it's because they want your, your heart there. So be careful when you see someone courting. Now, I don't do that too often, do I? <laughs> I don't like to tell people how good they are and this and that and and so forth. I'll encourage them when I see that they're down and they need to be encouraged. But I don't go around doing that. And there are some pastors that do that. I don't know why they do it. It could be that they're trying to draw people from to their church, you know, maybe. Uh, especially in a church where the pastor doesn't do that. Uh, because he's not trying to really draw them to do anything but to draw them to Christ alone. But yeah, they're very charismatic in, in their... And they're courting. Now, verse 21. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it was, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondswoman and the other by a free woman. Now, if you go back to Genesis chapter 21, you'll find that Abraham had a slave and had a son, Ishmael. He became uh, a representation of the flesh and of the law. And then he had Isaac, right, with uh, his wife Sarai, or Sarah, he became an example of grace and the, of the promise of God. So you have a picture there that Paul is using. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through the promise, which things are symbolic, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, that is the law, the Ten Commandments of God, which gave birth to bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai at Arabia and corresponds to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage to her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear, break forth and shout. Uh, you who do not travail, or uh, in, in a sense having birth pangs, you know, happening, for the, des the desolation or the desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as he who was born according to the flesh then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. Even so it is now. And he's probably looking at those Judaizers when he's saying this, right? <clears throat> this is nothing new. <clears throat> it's happened before. As I said, this young man that came in, that's nothing new. And it's going to happen again. Someone's going to come in and they're going to they're gonna try it again. But this time I'm not going to tolerate it. I'm immediately, see you later. We don't need you. Bye. Because it's cancer and you need to cut it out as quickly as possible. But what he's saying is this happened back then. And there was always a struggle between the bondwoman and Sarah and their children. They were always fighting. You remember the story? And how Sarah even went to Abraham and said, you need to kick her out. I don't want her around anymore. You know, so Abraham was really sad and he ended up kicking kicking her out and the boy, you know, and he wanted to help them, gave as much as he could. But it was God who who came to her in a vision and said, Don't worry, I'm gonna make a great nation of your of your son. Of course, it was a nation that would be an enmity with Israel all the time. Amen. And some suggest that <clears throat> that's why we have the Palestinian Israelite dilemma to this day. So nothing's new under the sun. It's still there, still going on. It's probably worse today maybe than it was back then, um, but nothing new. We still need Jesus, right? Yes. So <clears throat> he's saying just like today in Paul's times, uh, this Judaizers are coming against those who are of the free. Nevertheless, what does the scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heirs with the son of the free. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of free. So what should we do then? We should cast out the law. We should literally make it a point not to live according to the law. We should not live according to rules and regulations. We should live by grace, through faith, right? The just shall live by grace. By faith. And what am I saying? What are you saying? Don't live by the law. I mean, get rid of the Ten Commandments. I'm not saying get rid of them. We just don't live by them. They will not save us. They will not give us a right standing before God. They will not give us favor uh, from God. No, these things are done because we love God and we stand in faith. If a believer 
is living by faith because he knows God and he is in love with Jesus and is born again, then he is going to follow the law naturally. Amen. Not because someone has told him. <clears throat> Not because he even read it. Because it's a natural fruit that comes from his life. When I got saved, <clears throat> I started reading the Bible and I read the New Testament, the, the whole Bible within six months and then I started reading the, the New Testament. And what I found was interesting was as I was reading the Bible, the Holy Spirit was already working in my spirit to do things that the Bible was just now revealing to me. So all of a sudden, I, I received the Lord into my heart. I remember that day, I got on my knees in my, in my company truck. I was listening to, to Greg Glory on the radio and he gave the altar call and I got on my knees in my truck and I said, Lord, come into my heart, be my Lord, my Savior. Forgive me of all my wretched sins, Lord. And help me, Lord, to be born again. And almost immediately, I, the Spirit just fell on me, and my life went, whew, just changed. It wasn't a process of time in my life. It was immediate. And all of a sudden, I was in love with God. I was in love with God. I loved Him with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength. Everything that I had, I loved Him. And all of a sudden, I read in, in Exodus 21, you're to love God. And I'm like, oh, how did... How did the Bible know I was going to already love? That's so weird. That here I love God with everything, and now it's telling me to love God, but I'm already doing that, you know? Honor your father and mother, and all of a sudden I, I wanted to see my dad saved. I wanted to see my mom saved. Um, I, I wanted to help them out as much as I could. All of a sudden I started honoring them, where in the past I never thought of them at all, at all. And it's interesting that here we are, um, Christians and we're looked at as haters because we fight against homosexuality, we fight against abortions, but they don't see all the good that we do, right? We're the ones that take in all the foster children. We're the ones that adopt children who have no parents. It's all the Christians that are doing that. Uh, you look at the hospitals that are built around this country, they're all Christian hospitals, they're all Christian based. They're, they're stemmed from some religious organization that is built, not atheists. There's not one atheist hospital out there. They don't do any good. They only do what they want in their, you know, for themselves. So they don't see that. But my life started changing. I remember when um, all of a sudden I just had this urgency to talk to my mom. And so I drove from Redlands all the way to Rollins Heights on a Saturday morning. And it was early. And I, my mom was still in bed. And I knocked. And she didn't answer. I opened the door, peeked in. And she's laying there asleep. And I'm, wake her up. Mom. Mom. And she's like, what? What? You need Jesus, Mom. And she's like, what? I go, you need Jesus, Mom. You need Jesus in your heart right now. What are you talking about? What, are you, why'd you, what are you doing here? You know? And I'm like, Mom, because you need Jesus right now. You don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. You don't know if you're going to die this afternoon, Mom. So I want to make sure you know Jesus. I know Jesus. I, I've been going to church ever. No, I mean really know Jesus. He needs to be in your heart. You need to be born again. I go, Mom, what you need to do is confess him as your Lord and Savior. So let me lead you in a little sinner's prayer. She was like, okay. Okay, so I led her in the sinner's prayer, and she confessed. I'm like, okay, good, Mom. Now get up and make me some breakfast. <laughs> but that was the urgency, you know? And all of a sudden, I'm reading the Bible. I'm reading the Bible, and it says, share your faith. You know, preach the gospel. Go out to the world. And I'm like, how did it know I was going to do that already? See, that's the spirit in you. That's how you know you're a believer, because all of a sudden, you're... You're a fruit tree, and all of a sudden these fruits start coming up, and you're like, where did that come from? Because you're a fruit tree, because you're an apple tree, you're an orange tree, whatever it is, and those proper fruits will come. That's why it's important to know for sure that you are born again. And I, and I keep saying this, are you born again? Are you a new creature in Christ Jesus? Has your mind, your thoughts changed? Because they need to. My, my mind and thoughts changed. There was a time when I thought, homosexuality? Who cares? Just, you know, as long as you're not in my business, I'm not in your business to each his own. Live like you want to live. You know, I didn't care. You know, voting, it's like, I don't care who's president. I don't care what happens. To this. I just, I have my little family here that I got to take care of. I don't care about voting. I don't care about abortion. I don't care about the issues in, in life. And I don't care about the Africans or the Indians in India and, and so forth. I don't care about those things. And I get saved and it's like, Oh, no, homosexuality destroy our country. It destroyed Rome. It, it destroyed 
Sodom and Gomorrah, it will destroy us. I need to care. I need to fight against these things. Not, not, not hate the people, but love the people, but fight against that sin like yes. any other sin. You know, abortion, that's wrong. And so all of a sudden my mind started changing. And so your mind has to change. And it's so detailed it even has to change towards others. You need to love everyone. Everyone is to be loved. There is no partiality with God. He doesn't play favoritisms. You know, those things. God is impartial uh, to everyone. And so this change has to happen. And if that has not happened in your life, then you're not born again. And so I hope that you will take time to really seek the Lord and ask him to fill you with this Holy Spirit and cause you to be born again and become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this word this morning, Lord. And there is a battle, Father, for our salvation and for our very soul against the enemy, Lord. And he wants to rip us off and destroy us, Lord God. And God wants to save us. God wants to restore us and wants to bless us, Lord. And so, Lord, would you, through your Holy Spirit, open up our eyes and understanding so that we might receive Jesus into our hearts, Lord. Lord Jesus, come into our hearts. Be our Savior. Forgive us of our sins and help us to be born again, Lord. Lord, whatever that looks like, however that works, Lord, I'm asking for it. For you, Lord, through your spirit to work in mine, Lord, and help me to change, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you said that prayer, or if you said that prayer a year ago, and you said it in this ministry and through this uh, venue here of our Devo, let us know. It would be really encouraging to know how many people have received Christ through this this devotion that we do for the past three years, that would be really encouraging. I, I encourage you to post something. If you have any prayer requests, please post them and we will pray for you. God bless you. Have a wonderful Friday and a wonderful weekend. If you don't have a church to go to, I encourage you to join us at 5383 Martin Street and we're in Harupa Valley. And don't forget about tomorrow at 11 a.m. here at the church, free spaghetti meal with all the fixings. Uh, clothing giveaway, and there's a lot of new stuff too that will be given away. God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend.